Welcome back to another episode of Minecraft Playground. In this episode, I make terpbutyl chloride. Now, this alkyl halide is a very versatile compound, more so than terpbutanol. This is because it can react with primary alcohols to form terpbutyl ethers, which are more resistant to peroxidations. It can also react with lithium metal to form terpbutyl lithium, which is the most powerful nucleophilic base in all of chemistry. It can also be used just as a terpbutyl substituent if you want to add on to arenes or um, regular alkyl chains. But that's enough about terpbutyl chloride. Let's begin. But before we do, don't forget to like and subscribe this video. Now, let's begin. The materials you need are terpbutanol, calcium chloride, hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, and sodium carbonate. The first thing I'm going to do is pour in 500 milliliters of cold terpbutanol into a one liter boiling flask. This is approximately 5.23 moles of terpbutanol. Then I'm going to drop in a stir rod and place it on a stir plate. I'm going to set the stir rate on high. That way the calcium chloride will thoroughly blend instead of settle at the bottom. Finally, I'm going to put in 550 milliliters of 31.45% muriatic acid. It is important that it be freezed so the reaction proceeds only through SN1. The low temperatures also inhibit hydrolysis of the terpbutyl chloride. After adding it all, I cap it with a vacuum adapter. What's happening in this flask is an SN1 reaction, or a unimolecular nucleophilic substitution. Big word, I know, so let me break it down. The unimolecular means the reaction rate is only affected by the amount of one reactant, in this case terpbutanol, as it is the molecule being transformed. Nucleophilic substitution means a negatively charged species, in this case the chloride ion, displaces a lesser charged species, in this case water. So to put this in perspective, hydrochloric acid first protonates the hydroxyl group on the terpbutanol. This causes it to leave as water. The terpbutyl cation quickly takes on the chloride anion to form terpbutyl chloride. The more chloride ions there are, the more likely this reaction will recede to completion instead of reverts to terpbutanol. Although the equilibrium favors the products, it is an equilibrium nonetheless. An hour later, the flask has become somewhat clear. I stopped the stirring a few minutes ago so the layers could separate. But if I start it back up, you can see the opaque aqueous layer forming ripples on the bottom. I add 20 more grams of calcium chloride to salt out any terpbutyl chloride hiding in the aqueous layer. 10 more minutes later, the layer is clearly separated. This is because terpbutyl chloride is insoluble in water. I'm going to skim off this layer to force the equilibrium to give me more terpbutyl chloride. After, I add some sulfuric acid. During the addition, I forgot that calcium chloride reacts to make the insoluble gypsum, as evidenced by the milky white chunks forming. However, this hydrophilic salt would force out all the terpbutyl chloride from the water, so I consider this a happy accident. And what do you know? Some terpbutyl chloride does come out of solution. In all, I got a little over 400 milliliters of crude terpbutyl chloride. There may still be some hydrogen chloride and water in here, so I drop a stir bar, and add some anhydrous sodium carbonate. This salt works on two levels. Not only will it neutralize the hydrogen chloride, but each molecule of sodium carbonate can sequester 10 molecules of water to form the decahydrate. This will not destroy the terpbutyl chloride because it is a weak base. Next, I decant off the terpbutyl chloride into a boiling flask. I heat it over 100 degrees to quickly boil this. During the distillation, the boiling flask becomes more translucent as the impurities concentrate, mainly sodium carbonate. In the receiving flask, I'm not sure what this cloudy liquid is I'm collecting, so I wait until the drops turn clear to discard and switch collecting flasks. Later, I collect crystal clear liquid, indicating pure terpbutyl chloride. Three hours later, the distillation is done. In total, I collected 308.2 grams of terpbutyl chloride. This is approximately 3.33 moles of terpbutyl chloride. With respect to the terpbutyl I used, I got a 64% yield. This is much better than the yields of similar experimenters which always seem to hover around 50%. This yield is also on par with many research papers online. I'm going to store my terpbutyl chloride in here for now until I get a more permanent container. Make sure to store it in a freezer to reduce volatility. 